good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you want in the world. We have guests from different countries. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dear guests, I want to introduce myself first. My name is Aslı Kahraman. I'm working as an associate professor in Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital with uh, Professor Dr. Kamil Sucu. He is the manager of the neurosurgery department of my uh, hospital. Uh, and these online education meetings have started with uh, him. He's, um, and uh, it contributes uh, all of the residents of our hospital and with contributions of experts from other departments like me, pathology, oncology, etc. Um, I kindly ask from all participants, keep your microphones turned off during the presentation uh, to avoid the voice and noise pollution. You can ask your questions, but not by turning on your microphones. Instead of that, writing uh, to the chat part of Zoom program. At the end of the presentation, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed, but mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. Please do not ask for your microphone to be turned off. And now I would like to introduce our guest. It's my privilege to present this lecturer and Professor Martin Van Den Band. Uh, he, he is Professor Van Dam Band is working at a Brain Tumor Center at Erasmus University Medical Center in Rotterdam. He has a lot of awards and honors, such as Award of Ex Excellence in Adult Clinical Research from Society of Neuro-Oncology in USA and many of others. He has also have a lot of other professional activities in European Organization for Research and Treatment Cancer in RANO and EANO, European Association of Neuro-Oncology. He has a lot of published articles, clinical research, and editorial boards and books. He, um, and he, I would like to emphasize that Professor Van den Band is a high profile scientist. He has 634 publications, which listed on the web of science, the number of citations received so, so far, these uh, for 644 publications, approximately 50,000 of Web of Science. His Web of Science hash index is 91. Welcome again, Professor Van Damband. Now you can start sharing your screen. Okay. You can turn on your microphone, Professor. Yes, I did. I did. I thank you for your kind words. I will uh, start sharing my screen so that we can start. Well, first of all, thank you for um, uh, for having me. It's um, um, it's an interesting experience these uh, video conferences, and um, I was asked to talk with you about oligodendrogloma, uh, and I will try to give you an overview where we stand today, some of the issues, without trying to be um, uh, comprehensive, as that's uh, impossible in this uh, fast-moving field, and I also will be emphasizing the um, uh, the clinical status of our field. So here are my disclosures. Um, a little bit of the background in terms of epidemiology. Uh, uh, you are all from the field of, of brain tumors, so you know um, about um, uh, the most frequent one, which is the glioblastoma. Uh, with the uh, current uh, novel classification uh, based on IDH, we have about uh, as much uh, uh, oligodendrogloma as low-grade astrocytoma, IDH mutated, and then still the anaplastic astrocytoma. So oligodendrogloma is still a little bit more um, uh, rare than astrocytoma. But it's one of the most uh, more frequent in, in, in centers that are taking care of brain tumor patients. It's one of the more, more frequent um, uh, low-grade tumors. Um, for instance, in um, 
Uh, in Germany, uh, 5,000 gliomas per year, uh, 1,200 gliomas with an IDH mutation. Divide that by half, and you have about the number of oligodendrogliomas. It should be like uh, 400, 500 oligodendrogliomas cases. They are typically diagnosed between the age of 25 to 55 for IDH mutated tumors. There is a trend towards oligodendrogliomas occurring in a slightly older age, and it's not rare that you see a, a, a oligodendrogliomas patient uh, presenting for the first time beyond the age of 55. Now, a lot of the uh, 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 past uh, confusion about the diagnostic has been completely resolved by the uh, coming to the uh, clinical arena of the molecular diagnostics in 2016 with the WHO classification. What I'm showing here is a slide of one of our older trials, um, which was on anaplastic astrocytoma. Uh, patients were locally diagnosed, enrolled in the trial. Our central um, review pathologist, Max Cross, was reviewing the cases. And you see here the experience of the first half of this um, series where uh, the, um, uh, the pink line is the glioblastomas that he felt to be present and all patients should have an anaplastic oligodendroma. Um, we um, uh, repeated the, um, uh, the classification procedure using next generation sequencing along the lines of the current WHO 2060. And what you can see is that with classical pathology, uh, we identified 32 glioblastomas with, with next generation sequencing that number raised to 55. You also see that the prognosis of the patients with an oligodendroma, the blue line, uh, we identified more of those to begin with. Uh, sorry, less of that. But the patients we identified had actually a better outcome. So this speaks to the superior classification of, of, of diffuse glioma used in molecular diagnostics. And this is now the cornerstone of the uh, WHO classification, as shown here. Um, today, I will be talking about the red column, the IDH mutated, one P90Q code leaded, oligodendrogramma. And if you uh, write a paper today, you don't have to mention IDH mutant, one P90Q code leaded anymore, as all oligodendrogrammas are by definition one P90Q code leaded, IDH mutated. Uh, the uh, addition of the molecular status is uh, uh, is uh, is not necessary anymore. Then. We, uh, we define two grades, low-grade oligodendrogromas and anaplastic oligodendrogromas. Sometimes a lot is made of this, but you need to realize that if you ask different pathologists to look at different samples, you often get different grades. And that was so in the past, that still is uh, at present. The other thing is that in the past, when they were talking about grade three uh, anaplastic oligodendrogroma, some of those cases were actually glioblastoma. So in the past, there was a huge survival difference between grade two and grade three. And now some series are actually being published in which there is no clear difference anymore between grade, grade two and grade three in terms of survival. I will get back to that uh, when I show some of the slides on the, uh, on the current uh, trials on radiation therapy with, um, uh, with chemotherapy. Important to realize is that the huge difference between grade two and grade three oligodendrogramma that was present in the past with the novel classification has decreased. The difference has become smaller. Now, um, it's well accepted today, and that's different from, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, what you do with somebody on an MR scan at a seizure and a lesion that looks like a low-grade glioma. The current understanding is that once you see a patient with a, a suspected low-grade glioma, if you can resect that safely, uh, that's the approach uh, that you should take. Um, this is from the series of uh, Jakula, Asger Jakula from Sweden, where they had looked at two different hospitals, one having an early surgery policy, one having an early watch and wait policy. And he could show it by this so-called postal code randomization. So randomization not by trial, but because different institutions took a completely different approach. He could show that the institution with the early resection had a better uh, survival than the institution that waited. And his data actually skewed the approach of neurologists towards early resection and, and of neurosurgeons towards early resection. And that's both clear and they, we republished the data in 2017 uh, where he also looked at the molecular status and he confirmed this 
uh, more favorable outcome uh, for low-grade IDH mutated tumors for both the astrocytoma and the oligodendroma. Now, apart from that, um, it's long been established, and as early as in 2007, with the paper from Smith from the, uh, from the group of Mitch Berger, where he showed that leaving um, as little behind as, uh, as possible uh, was improving outcome in, in low grade glioma patients. That has been confirmed in astrocytoma, but several papers in oligodendroma um, suggested that leaving some tumor behind in oligodendroma didn't have that much of an impact on outcome in, uh, in, uh, in oligodendroma. So here is a paper from my own institution uh, published uh, two or three years ago, where you can see that um, uh, there is a clear trend towards decreased survival if you leave behind a lot, but if you leave behind some, that doesn't tremendously impact overall survival. And there is the same paper, uh, from uh, same result from Cavordis, and there was another group from Boston area that basically all showed the same thing. If you leave some behind, some tumor behind, that doesn't seem to impact the prognosis of oligodendroma patients as much as it does in, in, in astrocytoma patients. When we were seeing this, and, and when I was looking at this graph uh, for the first time at the time when there were no other data sets uh, uh, supporting this, I asked myself, well, there could be two explanations. One explanation is that it doesn't matter that much because oligodendroma are so much more chemotherapy sensitive and so much more sensitive to radiation therapy that perhaps uh, leaving some tumor behind um, uh, is uh, that effect is eradicated by the subsequent treatment. The other explanation could be that we didn't wait long enough. And we know from the uh, past randomized trials that in trials on oligodendroma, you have to wait well beyond 10 years before you can make a final judgment of the results of your study. So that was the other consideration I have. And in fact, uh, we are currently working on an update of these data. And I've seen a similar data set now from UCSF with more follow-up and then uh, what seems to emerge from those data that also in oligodendroma, leaving as little behind as possible uh, also helps to improve. Leaving some tumor behind with more follow-up does seem to affect the outcome of patients. So this, this idea may change over time. Now, um, what do you do if you have a extensively dissected tumor? And there are some tumor left behind. A lot of confusion uh, exists around the age of 40. People thinking that if you have a patient over the age of 40, uh, that indicates a need for immediate post-operative treatment. And the same thing holds true for uh, having left some tumor behind. Why is this a discussion? Well, we're not curing these patients most of the times. So I will get back to that later, as there are some interesting long-term survival uh, results right now. But there is also uh, a, um, a side effect profile of the treatments that we are giving after surgery. So especially neurologists have been keen to watch and waiting policy. And here are the data from my institution where we show that on average in patients that have undergone an extensive resection, we wait uh, for um, three to four years, but if there is a complete resection, that waiting period is actually longer, that's, that's more than six years. And oligodendroma tend to grow less fast. So in oligodendroma, if some tumor is left behind, uh, it is probably safe not to give treatment regardless of the age of the patient. I just saw uh, this afternoon a patient of, he's now 61, we operated him 15 years ago, so he was 46. It was a cross total resection. And as of today, there has been no recurrence despite the fact that we never treated him after surgery. Now, people have been trying to identify the risk factors. And let me first go back to that age of 40. In the old times, when people were looking at large data sets of low-grade glioma, so it was clear that patients that were older had a worse outcome as compared to the patients that are younger. But we know now that this um, poor outcome of older patients is basically driven by patients with IDH wild-type tumors uh, having a low-grade histology, and we're now classifying them as glioblastoma. If you look at current data sets, um, the prognosis of patients until the, the age of 50 to 60 
um, doesn't change that much. So there is absolutely no reason anymore to take this age cutoff of 40 as a sort of um, a sacred line in the sand that divides the patient with a poor or a favorable prognosis. I'm showing you here a couple of analysis of, of, of risk factors. One is coming from the French Polar Network, who uh, identified cognitive dysfunction and diagnosis on histology, the number of mitosis, uh, more than eight, and no tumor resection, but only a biopsy as prognostic factors. In RTOG 9402, um, the assigned treatment was of pivotal importance um, uh, for the outcome of patients, as was neurological function. And of course, neurological function uh, relates to uh, the cognitive dysfunction and diagnosis. So that's again a clinical factor. If you present with a seizure, or if you present, if your patient presents with a focal deficits or cognitive deficits, that patient is more likely to have a, a poor outcome. In ERC 26951, we find two factors. We find age, so there is age still, but that's as age as a continuous variable, not with a cutoff of 40. And the closest assessed central histology review. So these are factors to consider if you are uh, confronted with a patient where you um, have to take a decision for treatment after surgery. There are some more data. Contrast enhancement um, is informative about the outcome of these patients. Remember, if the pathologist gets some sample of the tumor, he gets a tiny little piece. And most of that ends in the sucking tube. Most of the tumor ends in the sucking tube. Only a part of the tumor goes to the pathologist. The radiologist sees the entire tumor. So he can review the MR scan and sees if there are areas with contrast enhancement. And there were several series that show that patients with contrast uptake, even in patients which are subsequently diagnosed as a low-grade tumor by the pathologist, have a, have a worse outcome. And then there is homozygous uh, deletion of CDKN2A. Of course, now this is part of the grade four criteria in esocytoma IDH mutated, but it didn't make it to the um, uh, oligodendrochroma. Why is that? Well, the homozygous deletion of CDKN2A is only seen in patients with grade three oligodendrochroma. And it was felt that it wasn't necessary uh, to make this a separate criterion for grade three, as these patients all have a grade three. But if you look at these data, uh, again from the French, you clearly see that the patients with a, a homozygous deletion of CDKO2A are doing poorly. And that in the near future may perhaps uh, end up in, um, in the assignation of a grade four oligodendroma. The other thing is, these are only very few patients if you look at the entire data set. So yes, it may help you to identify a few patients, but that's just a handful of patients in a data set of more than 300 patients, more than 400 patients, I should say. So there are a number of reasons after surgery why you should think about uh, immediate post-operative or a wait and see policy. So what we use in our institution is large residual tumor volume because this situation as I've just shown in my slide on the watch and wait policy in my institution, that's a situation in which you typically wait for one or two years and then you start treatment anyway, so why bother? The other thing is that patients that are presenting with focal or cognitive deficits as opposed to seizures warrant early uh, post-operative uh, post treatment. Then we use anaplastic histology and enhancement still as criteria for immediate post-operative treatment. If there's an enhancing tumor and there is no necrosis, no endothelial proliferation, uh, and it is completely resected, then I would still be willing to consider an initial watch and wait policy and just monitor the patient uh, carefully and start treating once I see a change in the MR images. Now, in oligodendrogoma, studies have indicated um, sensitivity to both radiation therapy and chemotherapy in oligodendrogoma. And the next question I want to address is, what is the optimal post-surgical uh, care in oligodendrogoma patients? As here, there is a lot of discussion, and it helps you to understand the arguments and, and, and the data where these arguments are based upon. 
It all starts with the IDH mutation that results in a um, uh, aberrant metabolism of the cell, resulting in a reduced alpha tetraglutarate and an increased 2-hydroxyglutarate. This alpha tetraglutarate is actually necessary for some enzymes that are, for instance, involved in the resistance against chemotherapy. 2-hydroxyglutarate has a whole lot of other effects on tumor cells, including widespread methylation, um, uh, a decrease in, um, uh, in, in or it contributes to the immunosuppressive landscape of gliomas, it upregulates PY3K and mTOR signaling pathway, and it also introduces, it changes um, the NADPH, NADP plus ratio, which makes the cells more vulnerable to uh, radiation therapy. So what we are doing with our treatment is actually exploiting the vulnerabilities of a cell that has too much 2-hydroxyglutarate and too little alpha glutarate And here is a, a short um, description of what I have just been mentioning. The other thing that's now um, attracting attention is that these IDH-mutated tumors also have a disturbed uh, DNA repair mechanism, which potentially offers opportunities for PARP inhibitors. With our standard of care as of today, in grade two and grade three, IDH mutated gliomas is based on trials that were conducted on radiation therapy and chemotherapy. We have a number of trials. We have trials that have been comparing radiation therapy and the addition of radiation of chemotherapy to radiation therapy. And we have trials that compared radiation therapy to chemotherapy. Mm. And I will focus on these trials to um, uh, discuss the, uh, um, the, uh, the pros and cons of leaving out initial radiation therapy for chemotherapy alone. Let's start with the addition of chemotherapy to radiation therapy. There are three trials that independently have shown that if you add um, chemotherapy to radiation therapy, uh, survival is prolonged. Even if you compare it, if, if, even if you, if you realize that the patients that were initially treated with uh, radiation therapy alone got chemotherapy at the time of progression. So it means that the timing of that chemotherapy apparently made a difference. So here's the data from the EORTC study, a clear increase in, um, in overall survival with a uh, widening of the survival curves after more than six years, which was unexpected. We see a very similar picture from the RTOG study from the Americans. Um, little difference in design. It was intensified PCV given prior to radiation therapy, but a very similar analysis. And then there is a low-grade study uh, on uh, where patients were randomized with a low-grade uh, glioma and a post-hoc analysis was done to identify the IDH mutated 1P90Q code leaded oligodendroma as we now diagnose them in the WHO uh, classification. And you see again, the late separation. And despite the fact that we are looking at very few patients, the statistical significance is still reached. All these data show the same. Adding PCV to radiation therapy improves outcome in oligodendrogromas. There's a very interesting update about to be published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, R2G and EORTC have joined forces and try, decided to make one last long-term follow-up of these patients. And what you see is a striking similarity between the, these two data sets. So here is progression-free survival. Here is overall survival. Here are the data from the R2G study. And here are the data from the EORTC study. And you see a very similar picture. And I will show you in a table, and then you can easily comprehend the similarity between these studies. Because here are the data on progression-free survival, overall survival at 20 years. Both studies come up with a progression-free survival in anaplastic oligodendroma of more than 30%, and an overall survival of more than 35%. So this means that if you are looking at a uh, anaplastic oligodendroma patients, and you decide on uh, post-operative treatment with radiation therapy and chemotherapy, there is a one-third chance that this patient will still be free from progression after 20 years. 
And that was something that none of us realized as a possibility when we started these studies. The hazard ratio for overall survival compared to radiation therapy only in both studies is 0.60. Now, the concern of radiation therapy has always been that radiation therapy is damaging the normal brain. And uh, we know that we have seen, we all have seen these patients. The question is whether it is still in the same manner true um, uh, as at the time when we embarked on these studies, as we now use much more sophisticated radiation therapy techniques like uh, uh, ARC uh, radiotherapy, IMRT, and, and other novel techniques. Um, we looked in the EORTC data set uh, to a group of patients in, back in 2012, so with a follow-up of like 12 years, uh, on progression-free patients that were almost 30. And we found that 44% of them were really cognitive, very fit. But there were still a striking number of patients that really had some deficits that either made them no, no longer independent or meant that they were not able to continue working. When we did a similar um, uh, inquiry amongst people working eight years after the diagnosis of a low-grade glioma, both esophageal and oligodendrogliomas, and we found that in our country, about 50% of the patients still have a job uh, eight years after their diagnosis of a low-grade glioma. The question is, does it warrant postponement of radiation therapy? So I'm here showing you a patient with an oligodendroglioma, uh, a female, 45 years of age. In 2010, we decided to treat her with um, uh, PCV chemotherapy alone, as she had a sort of glamatosis. You can see that easily on the, the two-weighted images with a large frontal lesion, but there is also an area of abnormal signal intensity in the thalamic area. So we treated her... Uh, with PCV alone. In 2018, she, um, she had a recurrence, but as you can see, she had a very nice response to PCV alone and it lasted for eight years. So we were able to postpone radiation therapy for like eight years. Then we, um, and I'm missing some slides here, I'm sorry. Forget about this example. So we, uh, we treated a number of these patients. Um, uh, we started doing that late in the late 90s of the past uh, century. And here you see the data. Uh, at that time, it was still a histopathological diagnosis. So we identified the better outcome of the patient with the one p 90 q code lesion. And we found that the medium overall survival of one p 90 q code lesion patient was 10 years. And the 10-year progression-free survival was 34%. So one third of patients were still free from progression after 10 years. We, on average, delayed radiation therapy in the one P90Q co-leaded patients with six years. So this speaks to the ability of postpone further treatment with chemotherapy alone. But I just told you that adding radiation therapy a chemotherapy to radiation therapy helped improve outcome, and now we're giving chemotherapy alone. So what is the comparison between chemotherapy alone and radiation therapy alone? Two trials are available, and I'm focusing on the data from the oligodendroglioma. The one is on the low-grade glioma done by EORTC, comparing radiation therapy to temozolomide, and here left under are the patients with the oligodendroglioma. As you can see, um, the progression fee survival in these patients is more or less the same. The data set is not yet mature enough uh, to allow uh, an overall survival analysis. And as of today, the data set is still not mature. Yet. So we don't know exactly what the impact on overall survival is of the strategy uh, of first chemotherapy. But as you can clearly see for progression fee survival in oligodendroglioma, it doesn't make a lot of difference. It does make a difference, however, in esocytoma with an IDH mutation. Here, uh, radiation therapy uh, improves progression-free survival as compared to temozolomide. There is another trial from the Germans comparing radiation therapy to chemotherapy, and chemotherapy was both uh, PCV chemotherapy and temozolomide chemotherapy. In the entire late analysis, there was no difference between early radiation therapy and early chemotherapy. And if you look at the subsets, uh, the subsets are 
looking more or less the same. But there is clearly no indication that early chemotherapy will improve progression-free survival or overall survival in any of these groups. And if you look at the uh, quite um, busy survival slides with all the various subgroups, um, and I take out, if I leave in only the oligodendogloma, then you clearly see that um, early radiation therapy tends to an improved survival as compared to early chemotherapy alone. Now, that makes also sort of sense if we have shown that uh, adding chemotherapy to radiation therapy improves outcome and that chemotherapy has the same efficacy as radiation therapy. If you leave out early radiation therapy in order to improve cognition in patients, that may come at the price of, uh, of decreased survival. There is a trial addressing this. It's a trial from, uh, from the French. That trial has completed the cool, and interestingly, that trial has a, cognitive, has a cognitive endpoint. So the efficacy of the policy will be judged by the preservation of cognition. But what if the cognition is better preserved, but survival is clearly worse? What would then be the conclusion of that trial? At least we will have the data from, uh, and we will be able to inform our patients uh, in a way that we can't at this point in time, as we don't have the data from a good clinical trial that really analyzed this. The Germans have recently started a similar trial, which of course will take uh, at least another decade before we will have some results. I hope the French will deliver some results in a couple of years from now. Um, so I'm showing you here an example of a patient with a large tumor. Um, and there is a increased interest in protons as another way of trying to protect the brain uh, from radiotherapy damage. The, the normal brain of uh, the low dose radiation therapy was out. So this is my patient. You see a large tumor uh, involved in this area of the brain. And here you see the, the, the photon radiation therapy planning with the large uh, areas with low dose exposure of the brain, exposure of the brain to low dose radiation therapy. And you see here the better sparing of the um, normal brain by using protons. This looks actually very nice. And my patient was treated with, uh, with protons. And the result was actually very nice and she's doing well. But there is a common experience by many of us that have been seeing patients being treated with, with protons is that you often see unpredictable and completely unsuspect, unsuspected areas with clinically significant radiation necrosis. One of the worst cases with radiation necrosis I've seen in oligodendroma patients that was functioning normal and is now severely incapacitated. So protons carry a risk on its own, and it's not completely understood um, why and how this happens. Now, another um, area of concern that has been raised over the past years is that several papers have shown that if you have a patient relapsing after temozolomide chemotherapy, they often and that's in about 30 to 50% of cases, if they relapse, they relapse with a sort of hypermutated uh, genotype. So there are a lot of novel DNA lesions um, and those um, hypermutated recurrences have a more aggressive clinical behavior and they are insensitive to temozolomide. And these occur because of temozolomide induced uh, novel mutations in the mismatch repair system. If the mismatch repair system becomes um, mutated, then novel mutations are no longer repaired, and in a uh, right short period of time, a lot of new mutations uh, appear. A similar phenomenon has been seen with radiation therapy, which is associated with an increase of small and large deletions, which also results in a more aggressive uh, tumor uh, with a de-differentiated clinical behavior. And it has been seen that there's a decrease in CPG site methylation after prior radiation therapy or chemotherapy. So it's a consistent picture. A patient relapsing after radiation therapy and chemotherapy, um, uh, if they relapse, they relapse often with a more aggressive genotype and a more treatment-resistant tumor. This has actually led to some of my colleagues from the United States 
rec making the recommendation that you should not give temozolomide to an MGMT methylated tumor as when they recur, they will recur with a hypermutated recurrence and that's a bad thing for a patient. The question is whether this is um, good thinking or whether this is just going with the flow. And I think it is just going with the flow and not taking good um, knowledge of the details. What are these details? Does the hypermutated recurrences indeed impact survival? Uh, yes, they do. If you take it from the recurrence. So this slide and this slide from different series clearly show that if you have a hypermutated recurrences, the, um, uh, the prognosis of that patient is worse compared to a patient that does not have a hypermutated recurrence. But if you look back from the time of first diagnosis, there is no difference. So here's a series from Taut. Here's another series from Bartel that clearly show that if you take it uh, from the date of the initial diagnosis, there is no difference anymore. And that speaks to the observation that we have been making. So here's the trial from adding early chemotherapy to radiation therapy. It improves survival. So yes, if these patients relapse, they relapse um, uh, with a more difficult to treat tumor, but they live longer. So if they relapse, once they relapse, uh, their outcome is indeed worse, but in overall, in the entire patient population, they live longer. What do we do with treatments of recurrent tumors? Unfortunately, we are still very much in the same situation as we were one or two decades ago. We reoperate, we re radiate, we um, give another round of chemotherapy. Uh, but there are some developments here. The first one is on the um, uh, IDH inhibitors. I want to mention shortly the PARP inhibitors, and there are some interesting developments on uh, immunotherapy with vaccines against the mutant IDH protein. This is from the Germans. There are similar series in, in China and in, uh, in, in Duke, uh, where they use the uh, IDH mutation as the antigen uh, to um, uh, induce an immune response. The problem of low-grade theomas is of course that they are devoid of the T cells that are necessary to get a, a, a strong um, uh, immune response. But there are some interesting observations in that series. First of all, they noticed that they could induce it to, uh, both a T cell response as a immunoglobulin response. And they saw some cases of, of clear pseudoprogression. So they are confident that something may be happening and they are developing on a, a phase two trial as we speak. The problem of that phase two trial will of course be the long readout before we can make a conclusion as you have seen that uh, with today's standard of care, uh, these patients may live for many, many years. And that means that you have to follow these patients for a vaccine trial also for many, many years. Then there are the RDH inhibitors. IDH inhibitors were typically um, investigated in the same way as we do in all other oncological diseases. You start with late stage disease and several companies tried RDH inhibitors in late stage disease and, and nobody really saw convincing um, uh, results. Uh, most patients progressed regardless of the treatment they were on, which was quite a disappointment. But AGOS, with two of its IDH inhibitors, uh, started to look at patients early on in their disease. At the time, they had not yet been treated with radiation therapy and chemotherapy. And there, they didn't see immediate changes, which is also something that you do not expect with low-grade gliomas. If your response to chemotherapy, it's always a very protected uh, and sometimes very delayed response. I have seen cases where I didn't see the response until well after a year after the start of chemotherapy. But they started to see changes in the growth curve and they started to see uh, tumors that were actually shrinking. So based on these data, they have now initiated a trial, a phase three study on grade two gliomas in which they randomized the patients between the IDH inhibitor and placebo with the primary endpoint progression free survival. And that's a very interesting study. What all the data uh, from all the other styles have suggested that once a tumor becomes very far advanced, and that speaks to the hypermutated recurrences as well, uh, perhaps 
the tumor doesn't need the IDH mutation anymore. There are so many other novel mutations that drive these tumors uh, that the IDH mutation isn't critical anymore. And, and in inhibition of the IDH mutated protein doesn't make a difference anymore to those patients, but that could be different in early stage disease. So we look very much forward to the results of this study. So some conclusions, oligodendrogloma, <clears throat> slow growing tumors with many patients having prolonged survival. Um, residual tumor after surgery is associated with outcome and it is still a matter of how much uh, it is associated, but there is some association. The optimal post-operative treatment consists of a combination of radiation therapy and chemotherapy, and whether you can safely withhold chemotherapy in certain, uh, radiation therapy in certain cases is something to be discussed with the patient. There are situations in which one wants to avoid uh, total brain irradiation or near total brain irradiation and treat with chemotherapy alone, but the payoff that may be attached to is, is that um, the, uh, the survival of that patient can be less. And um, again, uh, quality of survival is a challenge and unmet need. And uh, if indeed those IDH inhibitors would early on postpone uh, the development of these tumors, that would mean a further postponement of the side effects of radiation therapy and chemotherapy, which would be very important for our patients. So here I want to stop, uh, but not without inviting you to the Yano meeting in 2022 in Vienna. Um, the meeting uh, is the preparations are in full progress. We have had a, a, a very high number of abstracts, almost as much as in 2019. So people are really eager to meet each other again. And we hope that we can see, we can um, uh, welcome uh, a large cohort of physicians uh, from Turkey as well. I thank you for your attention. And thank you, uh, Professor Martin. Uh, I, I thank you for uh, sharing this, uh, your knowledge too much. You have too much experience about oligos and it's useful for me. Uh, I want to, uh, I, I agree with you, we, we didn't uh, see the entire tumor and so the grading is uh, sometimes impossible uh, for us and it, the tumor will be different uh, behavior uh, regardless of grade. Uh, uh, and I didn't mention that uh, CD can to a homozygote deletion is important for oligos. Uh, I, I didn't know that is so important for oligos. Thank you for this knowledge too. Uh, I want to ask uh, a question about pediatric oligos. We know that uh, they moved plenty in the new classifications, but uh, before, do you have any experience? Uh, what's the uh, youngest oligo? which you treated before? Or the, 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 the youngest oligodendrogloma patient? Yes. And what about planted tumors? Do you have any experience before the uh, classifications of WHO 21 classifications, pediatric oligos? What about the your pediatric experience? pediatric oligodendrogliomas are uh, yes. what used to be called pediatric oligodendr oligodendrogliomas in children. So the pediatric oligos, um, it has become clear uh, by uh, molecular investigations that most of those do not carry the one P19Q code lesion. They have a similar histomorphology, but they are usually characterized by other um, abnormalities such as FTFR mutations and, and other uh, mutations in the um, in the MAP kinase pathway. Yes. Um, so. That has made clear why these pediatric tumors, pediatric patients with oligodendrogloma morphology didn't respond as well to radiation therapy and chemotherapy. Um, my youngest patient with uh, an oligodendrogloma uh, is probably in her early 20s. I have seen cases with astrocytoma IDH mutated as young as 13, 14 years. There are um, clear indications from the literature that that may even happen in patients as old as nine and 10 years, they have been described. Um, oligodendrogloma patients are typically older. If you have a patient with an oligodendrogloma under the microscope under the age of 18, it's probably something else. Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you.
uh, I will, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Kamil Suju. Um, we can make see any questions, questions. Or comments in the chat. No box. comments or questions. I, I didn't see. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for this detailed, detailed uh, presentation, Professor. Uh, we are happy today. And once more, thanks again for this wonderful uh, presentation and lecture. Okay. And so there is no any other comment or question. We we can mm, finish this uh, presentation. Thank you. I, I convinced everybody, so that's a good news. <laughs> okay. Bye bye for everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you.